the startling spike in anti-Semitic crimes in Brooklyn in the past few months is part of the larger trend occurring more broadly across the country and the world. Faith and community leaders representing populations in New York's, New York's diverse neighborhoods have banded together to find solution and reverse this trend. Today, we are fortunate to have the opportunity to hear and learn from so many of them. And we are, have a packed agenda, so I will now turn it over to Hindi Popko, Deputy Chief Planning Officer of UJA Federation of New York, who will open the conversation. Thank you, Hindi. Thank you, Tamar, and thank you to JFN for putting this incredibly important briefing together. Um, I'm sure many of you on the call will agree, it's a very strange time to be a Jew in New York, right? It's become almost the norm to open up your phone and see yet another report of an identifiably orthodox individual in Brooklyn getting beaten up, their hats knocked off, women having their schedules pulled. Um, and yet at the same time, we know from our own research that New Yorkers really love the Jewish community and they feel incredibly warmly towards us. And part of what we'll get into today is well then what's happening and how do we make sense of what's happening in particular on the streets of Brooklyn. Um, at UJA Federation, when we think about this challenge, we are incredibly gratified by the work of our partners on the ground, the JCRC and the Crown Heights Community Council that you will all have the privilege of hearing from today. Thanks to long standing relationships that the JCRC has built over decades, they are poised to lean into this challenge um, in new and different ways. Um, and in old ways, ways that have worked in the past in the 90s and have carried us through until this day. In addition to the critical intergroup relations work that the JCRC alongside its partners on the ground are pursuing, there's also a security challenge, real security challenge. And many of you on this call might be aware of the critical relationships that we've built um, with the Paul Singer Foundation and others, including Carolyn and Mark Rowan. And we are now collectively working together with the JCRC to engage in a wholesale upgrade of our community security infrastructure. Um, no one should though walk away from this call thinking, well then great, they raised all the funds that they need. The needs um, out there are immense and JCRC is always in need of more resources to meet the ongoing demands of what's happening in the city and in particular in Brooklyn. It's now my pleasure to turn it over to JFN member and more importantly for the purposes of this call, JCRC president Cheryl Fishbein will carry us through. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Hindi, and good afternoon to everyone. As president of the JCRC of New York, it is my honor to welcome you today to the seminar on anti-Semitism in New York. We wish to give our special thanks to the Jewish Funders Network, of which I'm a proud member for providing us with this wonderful opportunity. For over 40 years, JCRC has served as the primary community relations agency for the New York Jewish community, community which is now 1.4 million strong. Uh, we build long lasting relationships with public officials, ethnic and faith leaders, and other key influencers in New York. In an effort to protect the Jewish community of New York, the JCRC serves as the unofficial Jewish community liaison to the NYPD, the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, and other law enforcement. We're a proud partner of our beneficiary, UJ Federation of New York, to whom we are grateful for recently funding this major security initiative that you just heard about from Hindi. Um, this initiative is being spearheaded by JCRC to enhance security for over 2,000 Jewish institutions in the New York City metropolitan area. While we're all aware of the increase in white supremacist and neo-Nazi hate groups today in New York, today's webinar will focus on the unique situation in New York, specifically in Brooklyn, where most people who draw swastikas on buildings don't exactly fit the mold of the white supremacist. And there is more than meets the eye that goes on in Brooklyn today and as the communities begin to change. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce Michael Miller, Executive Vice President and CEO of JCRC New York, who himself is a clergy liaison in the New York City Police Department and a chaplain at the Port Authority Police Department. Michael, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Cheryl. Thank you to Hindi as well. And certainly thank you to Jewish Funders Network for sponsoring this webinar. Um, I'd like to introduce 
for all of our viewers uh, who the panelists are going to be. We're going to be posing a few questions to each of the panelists. We all recognize the time constraints. Uh, so uh, please panelists, let's uh, try to keep this as uh, tightly knit as possible. Um, joining us today are four individuals who really are on the ground with regard to the issues that uh, both uh, Cheryl and Hindi out laid out, um, as well as Tamar. Detective Mark Molinari is a deputy inspector uh, in the New York Police Department and commanding officer of the NYPD Hate Crimes Task Force. Rabbi Ellie Cohn serves as executive director of the Crown Heights Jewish Community Council. Pastor Gil Munroes is the director of faith-based and clergy initiatives for Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams. And Rabbi Bob Kaplan is the director of the Center for Community Leadership, which is the Intergroup Relations and Shared Society Division of our JCRCNY. First, a question to Detective Molinari, and thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, how does NYPD define a hate crime? <clears throat> well, thank, thank you for having me here today. I, I do appreciate uh, getting the time to get me on. The NYPD defines a hate crime by the way the New York State penal law does. And instead of going into the long run on sentence that it is, a hate crime is a crime that's motivated in whole or substantial part by the identity of the victim. So it's targeting somebody for who they are, the 10 protected identity classes of uh, race, religion, uh, gender, sexual orientation, and, and so on. Does the NYPD then have an explanation for the increase in hate crimes right now in New York and specifically in Brooklyn? I wish we did. Uh, there is an increase right now. I, I'll give you some quick stats that I have in front of me. Um, right now, we're at uh, 353 hate crimes in the city for this year. As an indicator, last year we did 361 for the entire year. So now we're still looking at what, approximately nine weeks left in 2019, and we're already closing in on our number. We are at right now 188 anti-Semitic hate crimes. Last year, we had a total of 188 anti-Semitic hate crimes. So we're already at last year's number as of now. Um, we do see the increase uh, overall, almost 30% anti-Semitic. We see an increase of 45%. Why that's happening, we really can't narrow down uh, an important uh, message that was already given by the moderator was that we do see an increase in neo-Nazi activity in the nation. Um, I'm sure there's an increase in neo-Nazi sentiment in New York, but there is not an increase in that kind of activity here. These are uh, random crimes being done by random individuals, 350 some odd, usually, which makes them even harder to round up. I often say, I wish we uh, could narrow them down to one group of people doing it because you re you remove the group, you remove the problem. We have random individuals. We're chasing 350 ghosts around New York City and trying to apprehend them. Hmm. I'm going, thank you very much, Detective. I'm going to move on to Rabbi Cohn. Uh, again, Rabbi Ellie Cohn from the Crown Heights Jewish Community Council. How is anti-Semitism and community change impacting on the Jewish community in Crown Heights? Well, first of all, I'm very honored to be here. I hope everybody hears me. Yes, it looks like the thing went yellow, so probably I'm speaking. Um, the, I mean, there are two separate questions. There. There, is, there is definitely a lot of change in the community, and we're also seeing uh, definitely over the past two years, so I think even Detective Molinari's uh, statistics last year, this year over last doesn't tell the whole story because we have to go back two years, really, and over the past two years we've seen a steady um, chain of similar incidents that have definitely impacted the community. Um, there is, a, I think that the, the community is very resilient. It's still a very safe community. I think people are still comfortable being here, but there's always the concern that, you know, with the communication being what it is, that everything that happens is immediately projected out, and it does really uh, affect the community on a day-to-day -day basis in seeing reports of these types of incidents going on. So the first thing is, I mean, I have been asked, you know, and in, obviously in other places in the world where, um, whether it, there, where anti-Semitism is a very serious concern and there've been, a, 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 where whole communities feel under siege, it's not that kind of level here, but it's definitely the, at the point where there is a concern and the people are looking and wondering where is this coming from. 
At the same time, it is true that there is change in the community. We're talking about uh, Crown Heights is an area with a lot of gentrification, uh, fa uh, families, Jewish and non-Jewish, being pushed out of their homes by um, by the rising rents and the inaffordability. And these tensions on a community definitely can contribute towards feelings of, uh, of unrest and uncertainty, and these do lead to um, scapegoating or other types of activities. So that definitely can be considered a factor here. Uh, so, uh, Rabbi Khan, so what solutions or interventions do you think need to happen in order to address the situation as it stands now? Well, the first, and uh, the Detective Molinari knows because uh, I've texted him in the middle of the night and he's responded, so he works 24 hours a day. The first is definitely the enforcement side. We have to, not only a prevention enforcement, so just from a policing point of view, to make sure there's a visible pre uh, police presence in the streets, which we're always advocating for and never happy with whatever we get. And secondly, when, God forbid, there is an incident, to make sure that law enforcement is, is taking it seriously, is responding, is on top of it, and the response from NYPD and from uh, the prosecutors, the DA's office, has been good. So that's on that side. And that's an important component that we should never lose track of And because um, enforcement is important in deterrence. But then on the other side, we have been engaged for many years, going back all the way to 1991, our organization, through a, a project that we call Project CARE and through cooperation with a number of different organizations. And JCRC has been a good um, facilitator in this also of reaching out to various community organizations of different ethnicities and trying to figure out between us how neighbors coexist in a community. We had uh, an event, One Crown Heights, that took place recently where we had community conversations around this issue, but also just a day of fun and activity in the park that was joined by people from all backgrounds, families, children, really beautiful event. So we really, and also response in when incidents do take place that cross the racial boundaries, we don't want to go back to 91, and we've been able to successfully to bring the community together so that whenever there is an, uh, an incident, the response is appropriate. If it's something that involves a crime, if it's something that involves uh, uh, some other kind of disturbance in the community, that the community comes together to respond rather than shooting arrows or stones of one another. Thank you very much. And let's turn to uh, the other side of the coin, to the other residents of Crown Heights uh, and of Brooklyn, and turn to Pastor Gil Monroe. Uh, Pastor Monroe, uh, how is community change from your perspective impacting on the African American and Caribbean communities in Crown Heights? Pastor Monroe? Yes, could you hear me? Yes. Could you hear me now? Uh, yes, very good. I'm trying to use a mic to help me. Um, I, again, it's a, it's a very difficult um, uh, situation when you look at the fact and, uh, that we all live on top of one another. Brooklyn is just a crowded place. A place. Uh, you have 2.9 million residents. And so therefore, uh, what you find is that we just live compacted together. And so our issues is everyone's issue. And a lot of the things that you've seen is just that we live in a, a, a really dense uh, space together. And we have to try to figure out how do we find ways to, to continue to live together. But in terms of community change, uh, since there, as Rabbi Cohn described it, uh, since there's gentrification, which is occurring uh, in Crown Heights, uh, how has that impacted on, if I can use the term, the black community, which includes both the African-American and the Caribbean-American and the African community, um, how, what, what level of impact is there and uh, what emerges out of that impact? Right. So, so uh, a lot of people are being uh, forced out of the homes, uh, rents are being higher. Uh, you have situations where you have just tension of, um, of police community relations. You have new individuals who are moving into the community, not understanding the history of the community. And therefore when they come in, um, they kind of keep them, they, you know, they, they keep to themselves. Um, and so it changed a lot because uh, you have the, the, the ones who have been there, who have been part of the, um, the revival of the community. It's kind of seeing that another group of people is coming and pushing them out. So there is some type of resentment, even though I'm not equating that to hate crime spike. 
Um, but I do think that there is some indicators that that could be one of the, the, the you know, one of the minor um, reasons moving forward. If that's a minor reason, what do you think the major reasons are? I've asked so, that question of, of yeah, the so, military as well. Yeah. So, so police work will, will tell you that people commit the crime where they live. And um, as I said to you before, is that, you know, people live on top of one another. And so I don't want to diminish the hate crimes. Of course not. But I think that because we live, you know, on top of one another, uh, sometimes because of less of information, uh, people are not educated enough. Uh, people see what is happening nationally. Um, I think that people are reacting. They're lashing out to the other, not understanding that they live next to one another. So I, I believe that one of the big issues is that we, we just live among each other and therefore we, we commit crimes against each other. So what do you think then, uh, I asked the same question of, of Rabbi Cohn, uh, from your perspective, what are the solutions or interventions that you think would be needed uh, in order to address this issue? So just this morning, as a matter of fact, myself, Rabbi Cohen, uh, Rabbi uh, Bob Kaplan, um, Brian Cunningham, and many others met in Crown Heights. Uh, this is something that's ongoing for us. Um, so what is needed and what we have been doing is consistently working on this issue and this problem. I give the story all the time. Um, we were at the meeting at the uh, Brooklyn Children's Museum and Rabbi Cohen said that one of the families who was, um, my cat here, one of the families um, who um, was, was uh, assaulted, texted him while we were in a meeting and said, I haven't seen it on the news. No one is working on the case. And I told him to tell the individuals, here you are with a group of individuals working on the situation day in and day out. It is not always on the news that we're on the news, but we are working. So what I would say, what are some of the solutions to this yeah. is what we are doing is meeting across the board with cross-section of individuals who have the pulse in the community working together for one goal. How do I live in Crown Heights along with my Jewish, along with my uh, white counterparts? How do we live in peace? How do we live together? And we are working on that question every single day. Thank you, Pastor. In fact, that's a very good segue to Rabbi Kaplan, Rabbi Bob Kaplan, um, who is here at JCRCNY and is our director of the Community uh, Leadership Center. Um, uh, Bob, how has JCRC and why been engaged in preventing community conflict and helping to foster better, more trusting relationships among the diversity of the community? Bob? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, again, I'm honored to be part of this group and as uh, Ellie and um, and Gil mentioned before, we just met this morning. Now, we've been involved in this community. Zelly talked about Project CARE. Project CARE was started over 20 years ago. And it was a coalition of community leaders that came together after the disturbances of, of the summer of 1991. And again, it depends upon whose lens you're looking through. From some folks' lens, it was a pogrom. Some, from some other communities' uh, lens, it was a social uprising. From uh, another community, you might have seen it as a riot. To be able to bring everyone to the table, to be able to understand what had happened, how it impacted the community, how it impact, impacted parts of the community, and then to work on real social issues in the community. We worked on the census in the past, We were, and we're working, we'll work on it again in the future. We worked on health care. We worked on quality of life issues. And matter of fact, at the meeting this morning, one of the issues that came up was 311. How do we deal with quality of life issues in the community? And how do we understand how to communicate with each other? So again, at the meeting this morning, we talked about having ongoing dialogue uh, process happening in the community to, to initiate new dialogues between community leaders so that they learn how to, or relearn how to talk to each other, how to, to break down some of those barriers so we understand how to unpack the issues that are happening in the community both gentrification, both community change, anti-Semitism, hate crimes, violence. How do we understand how it's impacting the other and how can we become partners in a problem solving process? Right, thank you for that. Um, I, Bob, I may throw this out as really for the entire panel, but why don't you, you started on this, so why don't, why don't you take the first crack at the next question, which is uh, what are some of the challenges and successes in meeting this rise in anti-Semitic and hate-inspired hate crimes today? 
Well, certainly um, the One Crown Heights, which is the next step of Project CARE, is one of those successes. Uh, at the 25th anniversary of the 1991 riots, we did a unique thing. We had a day of gathering memorial and a day of celebration. We wanted to close the door on what happened 25 years ago. You can never completely close the door, but we wanted to close it and move it on to how we're going to perceive the future together. So there's an ongoing group that meets in Crown Heights and that when something happens, everyone steps up to make sure that it is condemned roundly by all segments of the population. That's not something that would have happened in the past. Secondly is what we're talking about now, is putting together these community-based dialogues so that leaders and community folks can begin to learn how to talk to each other, putting squarely on the table some of the issues that are concerning their communities, that are affecting their communities, and how we can begin to solve problems together. So it's not just a dialogue, it's gonna morph into unpacking some of the issues and developing the initiatives locally on dealing locally and citywide with some of the more broad issues that are impacting the various diverse communities, fully understanding that the population has shifted tremendously. I mean, Crown Heights is one of the fastest gentrifying communities in the city right now. And the displacement issues, the housing issues, the resources issues are very, very pressing upon everyone that's living in the community, except some folks see it only as my problem not your problem. We have to see it as a common problem. Well, Detective Moneri, you feel that uh, what Bob has, has laid out um, will hopefully tamp down the, the rise in anti-Semitic uh, incidents. Um, and even if what he's laying out um, is, is effective, what else might be effective uh, to try to uh, put a cap on this? Well, I definitely agree with uh, Rabbi Kaplan, and I've seen this. I'm in hate crime task force now for two and a half years, and I've seen a change in the way uh, organizations and the NYPD do this work. When I first got into this unit two and a half years ago, I was doing presentations for a community. And who was I presenting to? A group of Jewish people, or a group of Muslim people, or a gay pride event. But how do we talk about diversity and inclusion when I'm only speaking to one target audience. How are we diverse when we're not diverse in a room together? So I know Bob mentioned the, um, the Crown Heights Day they had to bring the entire community together. The NYPD has absolutely moved into that in all of our briefings that everybody is invited and everybody comes to these events. And I have seen it, look at this right here, look at this webinar we're doing right here, including multiple communities together, not being divided by race or religious lines, we're being divided by geographic lines. We're talking about Crown Heights here, so you've organized the Crown Heights community to come together. That's the move we have to go. We have to include everybody in the conversation in getting people to, to get along. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. And uh, Rabbi Cohn, uh, what, what are you, your views on this? Well, we've done some very interesting work that uh, is, I think, uh, doesn't really have a parallel. Uh, this, you know, there was an attack on a, a Jewish man a few months ago. And Jeffrey Davis, who is a district leader in our, uh, in our community and lives right around the corner from the main synagogue at 770, he came into my office and he said, what are we going to do about this? And I said, well, let's go talk to the kids. Let's try and figure out what's going on. And so we set up, together with the mayor's office, a series of, uh, we went into six different public schools. We brought up a panel of kids onto the stage and we sat and we talked with them in front of two, three hundred children at a time. We did it in... Uh, in junior high, in high school, and even in elementary school, to talk to the children and ask them what they think is going on in the community. Because just like uh, Detective Molinari said before, there is no profile, there is no understanding of where this is coming from. This is not a hate movement or a hate group. It, it's, very, it's coming from very different places, and it's coming from the kitchen tables and the workplaces and the, and the homes where, where, where pe or wherever people are, get, are picking up information. So... We went, we spoke to the kids, we didn't get any answers, but we had wonderful conversations with a great number of children. And I think that that itself, the, the modeling of the black guy and the Jewish guy standing together with our arms over our shoulder, each other's shoulders and talking about uh, what's going on in the community, listening to the kids, uh, was very, very effective. And also similarly, just recently, uh, you know, Jeffrey Davis produced a, ch a children's book about his interaction with the Rebbe years ago and how the Rebbe told him and his br late brother who was killed, uh, James E. Davis, 
how the Rebbe told them that uh, they shouldn't fight. They should, if they'll love each, love themselves, they'll love each other. So he's taken that message into into preschools. And I went with him to a couple of preschools. We sat on the floor with the kids and we talked to children about you know about loving yourself. And if you love yourself, you have room in your heart for other people too. And this was a great conversation through his book. And in one place. I sat down on the floor, and one of the little black girls who was sitting opposite me said, I'm afraid of you. And then a little bit later in the conversation, after we'd uh, gone through the book and spoken, she said, oh, I'm not afraid anymore. So it was a great moment. And, you know, if we could reach uh, 100,000 people in this neighborhood, I think we'll have no more problems. So uh, we'll work on that. Yeah, thanks, Sally. Uh, Pastor Gill, um, do you want to add anything to this? Sure. Um, I think that um, when you look at, at um, what we have done in terms of bringing um, over 200 um, Christians to Israel about a year and a half ago and recruiting pastors to understand um, how to stand in solidarity with Israel, that is profound. Um, to have 200 parishioners from Brooklyn leave Brooklyn to go to Israel, to stand in solidarity with Israel, right. speaks volumes. If I, could, if I could interrupt you, if you can go back to, to the uh, the genesis of, of that regard to the first trip of, of 11. Yes, right. As a matter of fact, in 2008, um, my first trip to Israel, of course, uh, was with JCRC. And so we thanked them for the tremendous support, uh, seeing the need of bringing um, leaders in Crown Heights and across Brooklyn and across New York City to experience Israel, to live it. We have been preaching the Bible for many years. Uh, we have heard about the conflicts in Israel, but we have never been to Israel. And so in 2008 was my first trip uh, going to Israel, life-changing experience. Here, here I am preaching and teaching the Bible for many, many years, going to school, but I've never landed foot in Israel. And so that, tr that inspired me uh, to not only for me to go, but to take all other individuals. And so we went back again, and JC, JCRC again was kind enough to take 10 leaders from Brooklyn, specifically from Brooklyn, to go to Israel to experience it. We came back and we decided, listen, why don't we take our, our parishioners with us? And uh, so ever since, we have been taking droves and droves of individuals back to Israel. Why? It's important so that they can understand the framework and the context of what the Jewish community is facing, but also understanding that we have a identifying product, which is the Holy Land. And so, therefore, we can't be kind to one another in terms of the, the, the scripture of, of the Jews, where we think, of course, Yeshua, where we got Jesus from, and not be able to love his people. So I think that is working. And I would also say to you, um, what is not going to work is the fact of people trying to divide us, um, saying that, well, if it was a Jewish situation, everyone would respond. If it was a black situation, people will not respond. No. Um, our Jewish brothers and sisters have stood with us when there's a black issue, when there's a shooting issue, um, and so we, we are going to stand. So that will not work. What is working is us standing in solidarity with one another. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to jump to a question which one of the viewers, uh, I believe is uh, Dmitry Goloborowski, um, has written in, and I'm going to direct this to uh, Detective Molinari. Um, given your statement that the anti-Semitic crimes could not be attributed to a particular group or a group of people, do you, Detective, do you think that perhaps the increase in crime is driven by a strong anti-Israel, uh, which is really anti-Jewish, he's writes in parentheses, a sentiment uh, in New York uh, further ignited by certain media? We are seeing this on virtually all New York City college campuses, both private and city colleges, and he would like to hear uh, your thoughts on this. Again, um, is some of this anti-Jewish uh, activity being driven by a strong anti-Israel sentiment? That's a very good question. Um, I don't really have any uh, cases to attribute to that. What's important to know is that, uh, let me get my numbers exactly for you, right now the anti-Semitic crimes in the city are taking up 53% of all hate crimes. 53% of all hate crimes in New York are targeting the Jewish community. But if you take the number of Jewish crimes, uh, anti-Jewish crimes, we're talking about 188 as of right now, probably 85% of them are the drawing of swastikas. 
that is a, a, a huge motivation in these hate crimes in itself. I'm not uh, justifying it, of course. If we're able to remove those, if we can get people to stop drawing the swastika, think about the reduction in hate crime we would have. You're probably talking about 150 plus hate crimes a year that would be removed. Um, the biggest push and in the increase that I see is the increase in swastikas. We have over a 50 something, 52, 53% increase in swastikas. I don't know if I could really relate that to the anti- Israel statement that we see out there. I, I don't have any correlation to talk to the political effects and how it fits into the religious, um, religious motivated crimes. Okay, thank you very much, the detective. Um, I wanna to go to a, another question to the entire panel. Um, if any one of you had a magic wand and funding was not an issue, what would you put in place to create positive change, uh, starting with Pastor Monroe's? Um, what I would put in place is that um, every individual, specifically who is coming into Crown Heights, uh, should have to take a, a, a course to learn about the history of Crown Heights. Um, I would also love in the educational system that the African American and Caribbean students learn about um, how the Jewish community uh, really supported the civil rights era movement and what it, what it meant to us. Uh, to have the partnership. I think history is important. And um, I think that Crown Heights history is, is equally important. So if there was no funding issue, every resident coming in would have to take a test, learn, and then we can give them the keys to move into Crown Heights. Yeah, thank you. Before I ask uh, Rabbi Cohn to answer the same question, I just want to suggest to our listeners, if you would wish to ask a question to any one of our panelists or to all of them, uh, you, you see the, uh, uh, the icon at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please uh, type in a question like uh, Dimitri did, and we'll be happy to pose them to our panelists. Uh, so again, now to R Rabbi Cohn, if you had the, the magic wand and funding weren't an issue, what would you put in place? Well, um, I, oh, I, did I, yes, I did. Um, okay, so um, I clearly, um, any, anything that we could put to, I mean, you know, I only have so many hours in a day and, uh, you know, I have a job to do too, but it would be really nice to have the ability to bring more people together. I think the, the, the One Crown Heights uh, Festival that we did could be, you know, better publicized, better, better uh, have more attractions and bring more people together. I think that uh, having someone available to go into the schools, we're talking now about going into an, a couple of more high schools to bring children together to speak in, in a, uh, and, and do some of the similar things. Anything that we can do to bring community together is definitely uh, an antidote to uh, this type of activity because the more that we, that, that we know each other and, and the more that we get to understand each other, the less that we're going to have negative interactions, and that has to be true. So I would, anything that anyone wants to do in that area, I'd be happy to see it happen. Michael, I think your mic oh, is- I, I, Yeah, I muted. I'm sorry, Rabbi Kaplan, <laughs> turning okay. to Okay. How would you like to respond to that question? I'm gonna I'm gonna look strictly through the lens and build upon what my and my colleagues have said. Um, this is all being done, as Ellie said. He has another job. Gil has another job. There needs to be somebody in the community that wakes up in the morning and said, "This is their job." There needs to be someone in the community that is running this ongoing coalition building, this on, ongoing educational work, this ongoing dialogue work in the community. Um, right now, and, and for the past number of years, this has been through the quote unquote the kindness of, of people's part-time or, or added on. Um, there needs to be a formal educational curriculum in the schools, all the schools in the community, to teach the kids the history that Gil spoke about. There needs to be an ongoing dialogue system that's not run by volunteers, but has a professionalism to it with a, with a, a, a professionalized curriculum. Um, to build on something Gil was talking about before, uh, we, there has now been over eight well, as of this January, close to 800 parishioners in the community have gone to Israel following up on this trip that, that we helped organize a couple of years ago. There needs to be more of that. But however, locally, 
one of the ideas that the pastors came up with, one of the things that I do when I go on these trips with folks, I do ask the rabbi. It's the first time these folks have had a chance one-on-one -on -one or group-on-one -on -one to really interface and talk to someone from another faith group, another leader from a faith group. That needs to happen locally. So some, some of the pastors have asked for trainings and courses on understanding or unpacking the Jewish community and the other faith communities, not only for themselves as faith leaders, but then to next step to bring it into the individualized faith communities themselves so people begin to understand. Because one of the problems that we often don't talk about is that our kids don't mix. They don't get to talk to each other. So, for instance, a couple of years ago, um, and this was a three-year grant, sometimes you got to do it longer, uh, we helped to put together a, a Crown Heights' cooking uh, opportunity where we brought together women, young women, from uh, all the different sectors in the community to develop a common cookbook together. They learned about each other. They learned about eating and cooking and, and dietary laws and what's special and what's not uh, special in certain communities. And they put together an incredible process. The problem is that this needs to be ongoing because once you do one group of young people that can interface on that level, you got to continue doing it. So if we were thinking out of the box and weren't worrying about uh, funding, we'd be able to really bring a very thoughtful, professionalized process into the community to take it to the, all those next steps. And I agree with uh, uh, Inspector Molinari, that would help to damper down these kinds of issues happening because folks who know each other and it would demystify the other. Right now we're talking about a complete misunderstanding. I'm in the case of many, many folks. The ones who are drawing swastikas don't know what they mean. We need to be able to educate. We need to do this on a regular basis, but it needs to be done from a professional point of view. Thank you, Bob. I want to turn to Detective Molinari. We just got a question typed in from Felicia Herman. Um, and she writes, uh, thanks to everyone for all their hard work. It's really impressive and inspiring. The fact that 85% of anti-Semitic hate crimes are the drawing of swastikas, i.e. graffiti, is incredibly important information, given that without that information, people will hear hate crime and assume it's, a it's physical violence. Is the same true, uh, Detective, for hate crimes against other communities, that they are mostly graffiti? Uh, is, uh, is it that the incidences of graffiti are rising? Does that account for the overall rise? Or is violence also rising? How worried should a community be about graffiti, however offensive? Detective? And thank you, Felicia. She, Felicia has a lot of great questions. There are a lot of great information also. Um, Let's look at that. Yes, uh, the swastika, the graffiti cases are a huge portion of the anti-Semitic crimes, uh, as opposed to physical violence crimes. I'm sure members of the Jewish community will agree with me when I say, so what? Swastikas are equally as offensive as physical acts. They're equally as offensive as words. They're equally as uh, destructive as words. So we do see that, that we don't see that breakdown in the other motivations, the other identity groups for hate crimes, because other identity groups don't have a swastika type item to be drawn or a certain phrase to be said. Usually in, in most uh, motivations, we see pretty much a 50-50% breakdown of criminal mischief, property damage crimes versus personal interaction crime. As I've said with the Jewish community, we see an 85-15 split where the 85% is the physical, uh, is the um, property damage and the 15 is the uh, physical interaction part of it. As I said, that's because there is no equivalent to the swastika. The same law does apply to uh, nooses and burning crosses. We just don't see as many of them displayed as we see swastikas. If I could jump Can in. Can I just jump in for a second? Because I just want to go on the, um, just, this, we should not give the impression that this is only a problem of swastikas. I mean, Crown Heights over the last two years has seen physical violence, against individuals. We had the, the, the most recent case where a man's teeth were knocked out with a, with a brick. We had one unreported case of a man who was floored on the subway by uh, somebody who said Allah Akbar or something like this. As he, and in that case, I don't even know if it reached uh, Detective Molinari. We did discuss it. But he's a little upset with that we're not following through as much as we should. We had a number of uh, very severe, uh, we had a, a stabbing attack uh, on the street on Empire Boulevard where somebody was badly injured. So th this is not just about swastikas, and there is no just 
But just to talk about the point of swastikas for a second, depending on the context, uh, just like burning a cross on the lawn is sending a message to a community, so too in the wrong circumstances, when you paint a swastika in a very visible place, that is sending a message. It's not a question of just defacing property. It's a question of sending a message to a community of intimidation. But in, in Brooklyn, in Crown Heights, and also in Borough Park, there was uh, also an incident and a few incidents of Williamsburg where people who were obviously dressed as Hasidim were just set upon for no reason and physically assaulted, knocked to the ground, ha ha suffered severe physical injury. So this is not just a story about uh, property damage and, and, and mischief. So it's important to say that. Sure, we recognize it, certainly recognize it. I'm sure the detective recognizes it as well. And um, we know that uh, we, we need to be standing together with you and your other colleagues in, in Williamsburg and Borough Park and elsewhere in Brooklyn and across the city uh, as these incidences uh, take place. Uh, particularly those that are, are violent crimes. Um, I'm not seeing any additional questions from uh, the viewers. So I'm going to turn it over to, uh, um, to Cheryl Fishbein uh, to close the session and, uh, and thank JFN. Cheryl? Thank you, Michael. And thank you to all of our panelists who have been wonderful in their um, putting forth the information that I think all of us really need to know um, from many diverse directions, but it shows the capacity of the com various communities to work together, to support each other, to fight for the same things, to fight against anti-Semitism, to fight against racism, to try to come together and, and work against the forces of hate. And, um, and together with the police, what we're doing is to try to create a better, safer community. Um, and it, I think, I believe that the Crown Heights com community really serves as a model for the rest of New York City as to how we can bring people together. Um, so I would just like to thank all of you and your wisdom and to thank Michael and to thank UJ Federation again. And of course, for the Jewish Funders Network for this opportunity to bring forth this information to our funders. Uh, you should know that this is going to be recorded. There will be opportunities to view this webinar again. Um, and we look forward to everybody's input and further questions. We are available to all of you. So thank you very, very much.